back. Uh, please be seated. Find yourself a seat, please. So we'll come back to session three. Uh, we have called it Europe without America. This has also been the content of some other discussions earlier today, but I think we would like to dig a little bit deeper into this. What would Europe do if the US and potentially a second president, Donald Trump, withdraws from Europe and even NATO? I know Ian didn't like that, <laughs> that way of putting the question, but we will have a good time to discuss this now. The session will be shared by the excellent Stephen A. Langer that you met earlier today in my panel. With him on the stage, he has five outstanding speakers that will give insight from their respective countries. We will start with Justyna Gotkowska, who will give us the Polish perspective. Please, Justyna, come up to the podium. Thank you for the invitation um, to this terrific conference and uh, the very interesting panel. Uh, I will give you uh, my Polish perspective on three issues. Uh, first, the threat perspective, uh, perception um, uh, from Warsaw. Second, uh, European response as we see it necessary. Uh, and third, uh, a Polish response to the changing security situation and uh, highly uh, unstable security environment. A lot has been said uh, in previous panels and great remarks were given. Uh, so please excuse me if I uh, repeat some of them as I find it necessary to present uh, and for you to understand the Polish perception and responses. Uh, so first about threat perception. U.S. shifting focus away from Europe. This is the predominant uh, narrative when we talk about security and transatlantic relations. But I think that we in Warsaw and Poland would frame the challenge and the change in international relations that we are right now entering differently because I think that's a more, much more profound one and we need to understand its implications fully. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we entered fully a period of friction in international relations with regional powers like Russia attempting to undermine the international liberal order and the respective regional security systems. The United States has upheld this order with its security guarantees and power projections for the past 70 years. With extension and ad adjustment uh, of this order, especially to Central and Eastern Europe after the end of the Cold War. Russia and China uh, attempt uh, right now to undermine uh, this international liberal system and re regional security uh, order orders uh, in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific striving to establish orders based on hard military power uh, and on the principle of spheres of influence with, uh, econo within the uh, economic dimension, uh, repressing human rights and institutions uh, as they, say, uh, as they uh, constrain the exercise of the autocratic governance domestically. In Europe, the security order after the end of the Cold War was, was more broadly based on the 1990 Paris Charter that the Soviet Union and later on Russia signed to and on the OSCE principles, where state sovereignty, territorial integrity and freedom of choice in foreign and security policy were enshrined. enshrined. Uh, all this Russia has rejected uh, with the first open violations uh, of these rules in, nine, uh, in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and with full confrontation in 2022. Not to forget arms control agreements that Russia violated and undermined in recent years. And Russia has clearly stated its strategic goals in December 2021 by presenting two draft treaties um, and uh, uh, the goals that uh, were written there. Um, that uh, basically meant uh, subordin subordinating politically, economically and military Ukraine, uh, creating a zone of influence or a buffer zone in Central and uh, Eastern and partly in Northern Europe, and moving uh, U.S. tactical nu nuclear weapons out of Europe. And Katarzyna uh, Zyszk talked about uh, uh, Russian 
uh, long-term uh, goals um, uh, in Europe. China is going into the same direction in the Indo-Pacific, which draws U.S. attention and resources to the theater. And both China and Russia share these strategic goals and cooperate uh, with each other, even if China constrains, uh, constrains uh, its actions for now. Other smaller powers are using this opportunity to achieve their goals in unresolved conflicts. And so there is a growing friction in international re relations with rising volatility and uncertainty. And the possibility and time frame of these powers openly challenging the West may be shorter than we think. In, ca in the case of Russia, from our perspective, uh, that will depend on several factors. On the course of the war in Ukraine, on the credibility of deterrence and defense in Europe, on European Western domestic developments, on the state of transatlantic relations and on US presence in Europe in the future, and on what will happen in the Indo-Pacific. Russia will use windows of opportunities that it sees, and Moscow will not only depend its foreign policy actions on fully rebuilding and enhancing Russian military capabilities, uh, but uh, on uh, political opportunities that we might give them, and on our political, military, and economic weakness. I doubt whether political elites in the West grasp the challenge that is coming from Russia, and it has been stated uh, here on the stage before. We are in a denial uh, of Russian long-term strategic goals and the fe feasibility uh, uh, from the Russian side to achieving them. Many don't believe these uh, Russian strategic goals and, and uh, deny the, that Russia is able to achieve them. I think that many forget that Russia started the invasion of Ukraine because it thought Ukraine is weak, the West will not intervene, and that the war will, st will last three days or a week with uh, conquering Ki Kiev and installing a pro-Russian regime there. Many believe still that this war can be settled somehow between Russia and Ukraine, and the bad news is that it will not be so. Either Russia will be defeated, which will result in a regime change in Russia, or we may prepare for a Russian war against us in a couple of years. Um, what shall be the European response to this situation? From my pers Polish perspective, Trump and generally the Indo-Pacific shift will be a challenge to Europe, no doubt. Uh, the shift and the interlinkage between the two theaters might come anyway, and, uh, or will come anyway, and uh, it depends on us how we approach this challenge and how we try to avoid and mitigate ne negative consequences. Um, I don't think that uh, we will be faced with scenarios of U.S. withdrawal from NATO, but rather um, with a passive inactive stance uh, if uh, Trump wins the second term. So not Europe without America in the immediate future in case Trump, Trump wins the uh, presidential election, uh, but definitely Europe with less America uh, in, uh, in a such case in the coming year, or in a longer time frame, uh, if Biden uh, secures a second term. Irrespectively of, of a second Trump or Biden administration, European allies will need to do much more to show that they treat European security and defense seriously. First, more investment in own defense is a must. 2% is not enough. Uh, to prepare us for a Trump America, and in general, a US uh, that will be less involved in Europe, we need a commitment to spend much more and quicker, heading towards 3% of GDP in the short period of time. Uh, additionally, so that the argument cannot be raised that Europeans are bandwagoning on the US security and commitments, uh, this um, commitment should be uh, made uh, even before the Trump wins the elections. European coordinated military commitment for Ukraine needs as well to come as soon as possible. That might be the very median challenge that Europe might need to face and uh, substitute at least partly US military support in the coming months if the supplemental package will not pass through Congress or in a year after the elections in case of uh, Trump uh, um, uh, winning them uh, by Trump. Second, we need a quick implementation of European com commitments to NATO regional defense plans. It cannot be a five to 10 years perspective. Uh, it's great that NATO regional defense plans were adopted at the Vilnius summit, but committing resources to, to what has been agreed is slow and too slow for the current uh, quickly changing security environment. 
Strengthening the European, uh, European pillar in NATO is the task for Europeans that might lead to Europeanizing NATO in future, uh, taking into account uh, two conflicts in a time, at a time uh, and its uh, reper repercussions for Europe. Uh, do the regional defense plans foresee a diminished U.S. presence in Europe in case of a crisis or a conflict in the Indo-Pacific and uh, um, much uh, bigger U.S. engagement there? Do we have plans for such a situation right now in NATO? I have some doubts about that. At the, same, at the same time, I'm a bit restrained when it comes to discussions about Europeanizing the nuclear deterrent. NATO's nuclear deterrence is still based on U.S. nuclear capabilities and political will to use them. And it's very difficult for me to imagine that the Europeans have both the capabilities and political will to de develop a credible European nuclear deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Russia and uh, for the foreseeable future will have to rely on the U.S. Uh, 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 nuclear uh, deterrence guarantees. Mm, our task, as I see them, would be uh, in the nearest future to strengthen European conventional capabilities. How to shape a power balance in a much more Europeanized NATO? I think the US will still be a player, even in uh, such a, a Europeanized alliance. On part of the European allies, there will be a joint effort there to do more but I don't see a clear leader as none of the three biggest European allies separately has the capabilities to fully replace the US politically and militarily. Germany has a difficult past that effectively constrains its leadership capacity, especially with regarding to standing up to Russia. Despite the visible progress regarding military del deliveries to Ukraine, Berlin is still incapable of taking a strategic leadership. France lacks capabilities needed for a conventional large-scale war, but it's nuclear power, and, but it is a nuclear power and has a strategic culture that enables it to act quickly. UK is a very agile uh, ally seen from the perspective of the northeastern flank, but it's not part of the EU, which diminishes its ability to, to lead European efforts that will be partly embedded in the EU as well. Most capable allies on the northeastern flank, like Poland, would like to have a, a say in, a, in such a, a Europeanized uh, alliance. Uh, what is the Polish response, um, a national one? How uh, or is Poland prepared, pre preparing at all for a situation of less U.S. military presence in Europe uh, when you hear the news of uh, Poland betting on uh, strengthening Polish-US alliance. I think that after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Poland has decided, uh, decided on substantial investments in own military capabilities. Poland's military expenditure from budgetary and extra-budgetary funds reached 3.9% of GDP in 2023, and it will remain on that level in 2024, and it will be above, or the defense spending will stay above 3% in the coming years, as it is enshrined in a, budget, in a law that the parliament passed in 2022. More than a half of the 30 uh, 30 billion dollars spent 2023 for defense was invested in arms and military equipment. The current plans for the modernization of the Polish armed forces until 2035 will cost 133 billion dollars. And even the, if there will be a correction in both military procurement plans and expenditure by the um, new government, uh, Warsaw will still spend big on defense. And the goal is to prepare the Polish armed forces for a much more difficult security environment with an unknown degree of the US military presence in Europe in the future. But uh, at the same time, Poland sets on keeping as long and as, as much US present, uh, pres military presence on the eastern flank, irrespectively of the uh, Democratic or uh, Republican administration. The speedy implementation of the procurement programs reflects the conviction that there might be a need for an enhanced regional and European military posture already in 2026 and 2027 to deter and defend against an aggressive Russia. 
Poland therefore invests heavily, uh, foremost in land forces capabilities, like heavy armored vehicles, long-range long artillery uh, defense systems, as well as in the Air Force, with the purchase of new fighter jets, F-35 um, from the US, F-A-50s from South Korea, uh, and uh, others. The Navy, Territorial Defense Forces, and Cyberspace Defense Forces will also get a share of the modernization budget. The procurement process will be accompanied with an increase in the strength of the military, um, expanding their current sites of, uh, of about 160,000 up to three uh, 300,000 soldiers will probably be not possible. 300,000 um, uh, soldiers was the goal of the, of the old government, uh, but certainly there will be the, an effort to cross the 200,000 thresholds through combining different forms of military service. What do we expect from Trump administration to owe in Poland? Surely there are worries in Warsaw, but also more ease in comparison to Western Europe uh, due to different experience of Trump administration 1.0. Polish government under peace has developed a privileged relationship with Trump administration, um, which was based on the US concept of anchor allies. Allies willing and able, first of all, to invest in own security and defense and enhance economic ties uh, with the US. So Poland uh, signed enhanced defense cooper uh, cooperation agreement during the, with the Trump administration um, and uh, would like, I think, to repeat this experience of strengthening bilateral ties with the second Trump administration. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the challenge to Poland and other Northeastern flank countries that would like to uh, develop bilateral relations with the US uh, will be to make sure that NATO remains a core of trans transatlantic relations as it is key for deterrence and defense uh, in Europe. But in order for this to materialize, Western European allies need to do their share in, term, in terms of defense spending and uh, military support for Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Justina. Um, we don't, unfortunately, have uh, the very outspoken Dalia Grisbautskaita here with us. I'm very sorry to say that. Um, so before I call the next speaker, having spent a certain amount of time in the Baltics, let me talk for one minute or two minutes about the Balts are afraid, I think would be the, the conclusion. They are desperate to have NATO troops on every inch of every border which is not gonna happen. Um, it's probably strategically a bad idea, but the Lithuanians have convinced a bunch of people. Um, the Germans in particular have made this extraordinary commitment to station a permanent brigade in that country. It's not just leading the enhanced forward operation, but they're going to have a full group there with barracks and equipment and so on. Will this make the Bolts feel better? Probably. Will the Germans do it? I think so. The promise is to have it by, I think, 2026, maybe 2027. Um, but there clearly is this anxiety. Now, to me, when I talk to them, they're relieved about Finland, especially, and Sweden, because Sweden with Gotland, let's hope Sweden gets in very, very soon, but Gotland does help control the Baltic Sea, and, and to have the combination of Sweden and Finland, I think, gives the Baltic nations, probably for the first time, a degree of confidence that NATO will respond in time and effectively um, if the Russians should try something. Uh, everyone worries about Kaliningrad, the way they used to worry about the Fulda Gap, um, and it's a real concern. Um, but again, it's, it's very hard to calm people down when their lives are at stake, but I have the very strong feeling that at the moment, uh, Russia's pretty busy, and it's not eager to test NATO. Um, but. The, the, the anxiety in the Baltics is clear and obvious, um, and um, I think, you know, their desire is to have more NATO all the time, 
whether NATO can do that, whether that's the right way to put its forces or not, is another open question. So we can talk more about the Balts, but I, I did want to at least say that much. Um, and I'm sorry she's not here because she would be pithier and angrier and much more demanding than I could possibly be. So may I call for the German perspective, Karl-Heinz Kamp, can you come to the podium, Herr Kamp? Thank you very much for this kind invitation to give the German point of view. Actually, when Kate invited me and said I should give the German point of view in 10 minutes, we have an argument because I said, how shall I manage to say everything I know about German policy in 10 minutes? And she said, well, you can speak very, very slowly. So that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> so what is the, um, what is the, the German uh, position on uh, U.S. shifting away from Europe either violently by Donald Trump or more user-friendly by a democratic administration. Not sure whether we have such an official position, but let me make uh, three points. What are the bad news? What are the good news? And what is it that Germany and others in Europe should do? Let me start with the bad news. Whenever the transatlantic relationship seems in trouble, we have in Germany an emerging debate on an independent European defense. And this is exactly what is happening in these months. Um, and we either combine it with the term autonomous defense, as the French do, or we do it with the, with the, with the idea of a sovereign defense, like the Germans do. Um, and since decades now, EU members promise time and again that they have heard the wake-up calls and that they have to get their acts together and make the EU a global military player. The last promise came in 2019 when the EU Commission predicted a European Defense Union in 2025. This is not that long anymore, by the way. Um, in the recent weeks, we even had our former Foreign Minister Fischer proposing the idea of a European nuclear uh, capacity. Uh, no one knows how this is going to fly. They are very vague. Someone proposed a nuclear button which should be given like a merry-go-round to the European capitals. I mean, I don't want to comment this, but uh, it's, a very, it's a very German debate which we have there. <laughs> Why is this a bad news? It is a bad news because a true, a true European defense capacity is not going to happen. Um, with, and particularly with the war in Ukraine, I think it has become very clear that this idea of, the Europe, of a true European defense union is dead. And it is simply dead because the Eastern Europeans don't want it. They asked, where would we have been in the war against Russia without the US, with your sovereign or autonomous, or call it as you like, defense union? And and the last thing most European or EU members want to have is a European defense union under German or under French leadership, or worse, even both. Um, so, and, and, and by the way, so far, none of the European EU members spent the money necessary, uh, necessary for such an EU uh, defense capacity in uh, 2019, the IISS in London made the calculation, what would it take to have a European defense without US force multipliers to defend, and they had a certain scenario, an attack on the Baltics and part of Poland, and they came up with 357 billion US dollars necessary. Check where our defense budgets are in Europe, and you know where we are. Not to be misunderstood, this is not an EU bashing. The EU worked excellently in the Ukraine crisis. The EU worked excellently and it became a true international security player and a heavyweight with respect to sanctions against Russia, with respect to uh, civil and military support for Ukraine. I mean, 50 billion now recently is not a small number. With respect to assuring the energy supply for all EU members, um, but it is not a heavyweight in defense. Defense is still the prerogative of NATO because it's its core 
competence. And hence, the future lies in the cooperation, in the ever closer cooperation between EU and NATO and the functional job sharing uh, uh, provided that NATO survives uh, Trump. But then the people are asking, okay, but what is your plan B if really, what I don't believe, honestly, Trump should ruin NATO, then the Europeans might. No, they might not. They will all try to establish bilateral ties with the US, as Poland did in 2019 when they suggested the Fort Trump to be built. Uh, it's a sad development, but it's a development which we are going to see. Second point, two good news. The first good news from a German point of view, a good news on why the transatlantic relations might be more Trump-proof than it seems. The first good news is the German term Zeitenwende, which in the meantime made it into international language, the complete turnaround of, uh, of, of, NATO's, uh, of German policy. And the Chancellor Scholz speech of uh, February 2022 uh, differed from all previous German promises to do more by one thing, by putting 100 billion euros on the table. And that makes the hell of a difference. Is this enough, the 100? Maybe not. But it at least lifts Germany over the 2% uh, hurdle, and it diffuses, at least partly, US complaints about burden sharing with respect to Germany. Remember that Germany was the preferred goal uh, at that time of Trump, and the main target of the, of the Trump criticism, uh, at that time rightly so, of not spending uh, enough. And there is one other element in this Zeitenwende with, uh, which many people don't get. In the law that guarantees these 100 billion, it's a special law for this special fund, there is a sentence that says, if the money is used up, the 100 billion, in a couple of years, Germany will, the German parliament, will provide a defense budget, I quote, sufficient to grant the German contribution to NATO's capabilities goals. 2% will not be enough for this. But it is in the law. I'm not sure whether all parliamentarians really read what they signed there, but that's what the German parliament agreed upon. I admit all the difficulties in Germany of transforming the money the 100 billion into, uh, into defense capacities. Our procurement system is still cumbersome, and we lost time as we were not particularly lucky with one of our defense ministers. Still, 100 billion is the hell of a lot of money, and the French and the British army would be happy to have 100 billion in their piggy bank. Second good news is Russia gets weaker. With the outbreak of the war against Ukraine, we first learned that the Russians are not all six feet tall. And second, and since then, they lost an incredible amount of soldiers. We heard the figures already, 315,000 was the last estimate of US, US intelligence services. Uh, and it was particularly well-trained personnel they lost. Uh, Russia is burning most of its, modern, uh, of its modern weaponry, and it cannot reconstitute quickly enough. Sanctions might be incomplete, but they are harming Russia. They are strategically harming Russia, and it's, it's, and it's harming Russian economy in the longer run, even if they get support from China or from Turkey. And this decline is going on every day uh, as longer the war lasts and the weaker Russia gets, which means, and you heard this maybe that the US intelligence uh, assessment was that Russia's modernity level is now 18 years behind. Whether it's 18 or 10, I don't know, but at least significantly, Russia becomes less and less modern. Hence, there's a chance for NATO Europe, not that this is my preferred scenario, but there's a chance for NATO Europe that it will be able to defend NATO territory without US forces or with only limited US force presence in Europe. As I said, it's not a preferred scenario because US military presence conventional and nuclear is important. It's a key for deterrence and for the cohesion of NATO. Still, the military force relations in the next decade or so will fundamentally be, be different from the one before 22, and it will be in favor of Europe. So third point, what shall we do? What should be done from a, a German 
point of view. Three suggestions. First, instead of musing about the European Defense Union or even a European nuclear force, the uh, Europeans just should spend more on defense. Had been, has been said a couple of times. Uh, I can blow up my cheeks now because for the first time I don't have to be ashamed for my own country uh, in that respect with these uh, 100 billion. And Germany's way from the embarrassing 5,000 helmet offer now to be the second largest supporter of Ukraine is remarkable. And I would have, honestly, I would have not believed uh, this to happen. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, it's a shame that still 19 of uh, all NATO members, 18 Europeans, by the way, are not spending 2%. It's even more a shame that important countries like Italy or Canada are down to 1.2, 1.3%. Second point, the old transatlantic bargain on which the 70-year-old NATO is built upon uh, circled around the Soviet Union or later Russia. A new transatlantic bargain will have to circle much less about, uh, much less, much less about Russia but much more about the Asia Pacific and China. And this requires all Europeans in NATO and in EU to expand their horizon to the Asia Pacific and particularly to the democracies there, to Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea, the AP4. I found it a shame that at the last, uh, at the last NATO summit, NATO could not agree on putting an, uh, a liaison office in Tokyo. Third point, last point, which is closely intertwined to the previous one, transatlantic burden sharing is more than money. Um, except the UK or France, none of the Europeans is able to act and operate militarily in the Asia Pacific. We just don't have the forces to go there. If these Europeans expect the US to defend their interests in the, in the region, then the Europeans have to engage much more in their neighborhood to disburden U.S. forces from Europe. This concerns the Mediterranean, it concerns the Red Sea, it concerns the, pa uh, it concerns the Persian Gulf. The U.S. still have, has forces in Kosovo. Try to any U.S. voter why you have forces in Kosovo, which is a purely European um, issue. Um, this is easier said than done. It took weeks before the EU found a consensus to take part in the anti-Houthi mission in the Red Sea. Germany takes part with only one frigate, which shows how difficult it is to bring the forces necessary, at least now. Um, at the same time, as it has been said a couple of times this, uh, uh, on this day, that more burden sharing will be requested from the US regardless who is in the White House in future. Is this enough to pacify a Trump administration? No one knows, as particularly Trump is much more driven by his own narcissism than by a concept, uh, and that makes him so, so unpredictable. Uh, however, at, <clears throat> but these are measures which Germany and others in Europe have to take anyway. And on that happy note, I thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Karl Heinz. I have questions for you, but I will wait. So. <laughs> <laughs> Next speaker, Camille Grand, now at the ECFR, former NATO something or other. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, that's, that's an introduction. Uh, <laughs> the, um, I think, I think the, it's... Uh, it's even better than uh, this person needs no introduction, right? <laughs> so it's really, it's really great to be back um, uh, in Oslo for the, uh, the conference. And thank you, Kate and, and Camilla, for such a wonderful organization. Um, having worked for six years for Jens Stoltenberg, I always follow Norwegian leadership. Um, uh, but uh, now let me uh, focus uh, a little bit on the, uh, the French perspective and bring a French perspective. Uh, so I'll try to do a bit of both. Uh, and I think it's first important to, to maybe offer you a sense of the transformation of French defense policy over the last couple of years, which I think is quite significant <coughs> and sometimes overlooked in this part of Europe. Um, even though there is a, a, an effort to uh, uh, reach out, I was uh, last week in Stockholm where uh, um, there was a 
Macron's state visit and, and, a, and a good speech, uh, not only talking to the Swedes, but also to the wider Nordic, Nordic and Baltic allies, uh, which I think is, is important. So I think the, this, this transformation has been illustrated in a couple of, uh, of, of speeches indeed. The first one was in Bratislava. Uh, last spring, and interestingly, that speech is still old, um, and a lot of what has been said then st uh, remains uh, uh, policy uh, and has not been contradicted by other comments or, or um, interviews uh, in, in any shape or form, and has been, in fact, repeated in Stockholm uh, last week. So, so um, uh, uh, it's, I've, and let me maybe characterize these shifts in my own words, but I, uh, that could be... Um, uh, uh, sometimes a bit critical of past policies, but I think it's relevant. So number one, a, an end to the French illusions about Russia. Uh, and, and, you know, France had a long tradition of uh, dialogue with Russia and, and trying to engage Russia, not to humiliate Russia, uh, and all these uh, statements that uh, created a lot of sometimes concerns uh, amongst uh, other allies. And I think this, uh, um, Macron learned the hard way uh, on this and turned the page on that. It doesn't mean that this view is not still present in part of the public debate in, in Paris, but certainly Macron uh, is um, uh, really in a, in a different uh, 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 position than he was even um, a year and a half ago, and does recognize quite clearly that, um, there, that there is a, a hostile policy conducted by Russia on, or, uh, on Europe, uh, that this is a war uh, that has consequences for us and, and has been outspoken and clear that uh, Russia can't prevail in this war, um, which is important. Which leads to a second point, which is a very firm support to Ukraine, including in the form of NATO and EU membership, which, by the way, is an interesting nuance vis-à-vis uh, -vis our uh, German colleagues, and it was a sort of interesting... Uh, shift in Vilnius to have the, the French and the British being closer to the Eastern Europeans on opening the doors of NATO to uh, Ukraine, as opposed to the, the position of a number of, uh, of uh, other Western European countries, including and Washington, on being more cautious on that. And again, the, the point is both arguments can be made, but certainly it was interesting to see Paris uh, being uh, clearer on this than, than previously and probably in the 50 shades of gray on, of positions vis-a-vis -vis with regard to Ukrainian membership in the European institutions and NATO, uh, Paris sh clearly shifting from being one of the most opposed to being uh, a much more forward-leaning on that. Also in the delivery of high-hand military capabilities, uh, there has been a number of, of steps taken, even if I wish uh, France would do um, much more in terms of volumes of deliveries, and numbers. Third, there is a reinvestment in NATO. And I would, I would stress uh, that it's, uh, it's, it's sort of interesting because it's about presence in the Baltic region, in Romania, um, uh, in, in different, you know, both at, at sea, in the air, uh, and uh, on, with significant land forces. What I would stress, which I find even more interesting, is I would make the argument that since 1949, NATO was never front and center in French defense policy. We had all colonial wars or post-colonial wars. We had a focus on the national deterrent uh, as opposed to, to uh, a lot of things. Then we had, uh, as everyone else, the uh, decades of crisis management and counterterrorism. This is probably the first time in uh, at 75 years that NATO is front and center in the French defense policy, which is, which is quite new and interesting. All the consequences need to be drawn from that, which I would, I would uh, you know, we're not quite there yet, but I think it's, it's a very interesting element uh, that is, that is uh, there, which has also been leading to a lesser emphasis on the EU strategic autonomy narrative, uh, whenever uh, Macron, and again go back to the recent, most recent speeches, refers to that, it's always in the context of adding the complementarity with NATO. Of course, this is not in a competition in any shape or form, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Which really is, in, is a sort of interesting shift uh, there, and, and this is even more true for military commanders um, uh, uh, who, um, who are traditionally more focused on where French forces were deployed, which was traditionally not much of NATO uh, uh, duties, and is now no longer the case. 
Fourth, and, and jumping into the, the debate we're having right now, I don't think there is, to use a German word, any schadenfreude about a diminishing uh, 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 US commitment to European security. There is no, you know, there's a bit of we told you so, but not a, a, any form of, yes, this is a fantastic opportunity to pursue a, a domestic agenda of more EU and, 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 and anything of that. Quite the, quite the contrary, and again, the president has been explicit about that. Um, but also a sense of, of, uh, of responsibility, and I'll come back to that in, uh, on a few issues, of what is it that it means for the larger European countries in, in such a context. And, and the, the president has been alluding to this more and more clearly, and again in Stockholm, just a couple of days uh, last week, he was quite explicit on, on, uh, in response to Swedish questions about the fact that France would have a bigger role in the Baltic region, uh, uh, wanted to engage more with the countries in, the, in, in the, uh, both the high north and the Baltic. Uh, uh, and you could see that in the, the, the discussion with Poland, the discussion with a number of other, uh, 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 of other allies. Um, so, the, the, so it's a sort of interesting, uh, interesting element, uh, which does go as far as an opening on the nuclear deterrence conversation, which again is not about to replace the US extended deterrent, but about saying, and again I quote here, uh, of course there is a European dimension to the French vital interest and uh, uh, we do have a special responsibility and we are ready to uh, discuss this with, with European allies uh, if needed. All of this needs to be refined, it can't uh, happen alone, but it is a, an important part of this conversation, uh, which is not completely new, but the fact of saying it in Stockholm last week is uh, meaningful. So now, uh, more personal points on the thought experiment of a Europe without America. And there, um, a full disclosure, I just co-authored a piece in Foreign Affairs that Ian kindly referred to on Trump-proofing Europe. So that was published last week. So I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm trying, I'm jumping into the risk of that thought experiment, even though it's, uh, I know it's, uh, some, some would challenge it. So I think there, there are four work strands that really matter on the security realm. I, I don't touch on the other pieces of the article for which I, I, uh, uh, I, I co-authored. And there, what we're talking about is how do we mitigate the risks of a declining US commitment. Um, and I think it's important to think these in terms of, um, it's, it's a, in my view, a useful and necessary exercise on its own merit short of the election outcome. And I want to stress this because in a way, I would make the argument that we need to do more no matter what. Uh, 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 and I'll, I'll, uh, and uh, no, no matter what happens, and even if uh, with the most positive outcome. So let me uh, go through them very quickly because I know I'm running a bit out of time. Number one, we need to be able to step up our support for Ukraine. And I stress this as number one because this is the critical thing that we can do now and we are still a bit uh, short of that. So the US support was obviously critical in the first year. It continues to be critical, but I think the Europeans are stepping up and need to be a much more serious and disciplined approach about the support. The 50 billion was a good news uh, on that uh, uh, for the EU part, but we need to collectively do much more. And I, I like the idea of, you know, uh, if you frame it in terms of uh, why can't we spend 0.2 to 25% of our GDP to support Ukraine, I think we frame the conversation in different terms. So, but we also need to adapt our defense industrial base uh, to do this uh, with potentially uh, no or less uh, US support as the supplemental debate demonstrates. And the ammunition on that is only one element of the conversation. Second is to step up our ability to defend Europe, more money, more capabilities, more readiness, the European troops already provide 90% of, 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 of the peacetime combat forces of NATO in Europe. And there, just to pick a conversation with Carlines, um, uh, by the way, the IISS study, which said 350 billion is needed, that's what we're spending now. We moved 100 billion up to, to be there. So in, in conventional terms, there is no reason whatsoever why Europeans that have eight times the GDP of Russia and three times its defense budget can't defend Europe. So we really need to, to, to be better at uh, fixing the shortfalls. Amongst those shortfalls, running through this, strategic enablers are really a key element. 
We are missing that. We've been uh, over-reliant on the US on those. Intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, airlift, air-to-air -air refueling, space capabilities, command and control are critical elements where we need to do better and make a difference. Um, and there, there is a role for the European Union in its, uh, to, to put money into this and to build the base that will deliver this. Fourth and last, uh, uh, we need to address some of the hard strategic issues. Um, some of them have already been mentioned. I think the nuclear deterrence debate is an interesting one. The point there is not so much, uh, can we replace the US commitment to the form, in the form it, it, it exists? I don't think so, and that's not what's being asked by the way. Uh, but what room is there for the two European nuclear weapon states to uh, strengthen uh, uh, the overall NATO defense and deterrence posture in the nuclear realm, to mitigate the potential consequences or a wrong reading of a declining US commitment. And that is, you know, we are, again, we tend to think too much there in a bit of Cold War terms. When there were 30,000, you know, when there were tens of thousands of tactical nuclear weapons deployed in Europe, that was impossible to mitigate if we're talking about a form of existential deterrence, whereas it's sort of a different thing, which is a conversation with the US, the nuclear weapon states in Europe, but also the non-nuclear allies. Finally, uh, just one word on institutional issues. I would argue we need to fix the NATO-EU uh, debate uh, much more seriously than we've done in the past. We can't allow this to be as ridiculous as it is now. We also need to recognize that we are past the, the NATO versus EU conversation because we need the UK and Norway on board any conversation in, in Europe, but we also need the command structure of NATO, so we need to work that. So in a conclusion, I very much think it's high time for the Europeans to spend enough. I would argue that bilateralization that has been discussed is dangerous and dysfunctional. You're not going to buy your self-protection from Trump because the next contract will move protection elsewhere. And uh, I would argue to end on a good note that we are not quite doomed uh, and we can do something about it, which I think is important, uh, and that it will be useful no matter is the outcome of the U.S. election. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camille. Uh, Julian Lindley French for Thank you, Steve. a British perspective. Oh. <laughs> Carry on. That's right. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, this is not so much the British perspective as the British paradox that I'm going to very quickly address. Um, but I can't resist commenting on Jana's point about 30% of British youth, the great unwashed, um, wouldn't defend Britain. Well, that means 62% of them would. And they frighten me, I can tell you. I mean, you know. um, <laughs> And I'm also about to publish a, a new book with General Lord Richards called The Retreat from Strategy, which is brilliant and very reasonably priced, um, <laughs> in which we go into great depth about uh, uh, British uh, defence policy. But also on your Prime Minister's point, about 2% in 2026. You know, the last couple of weeks, I've been involved in a firefight in London because some genius in the Ministry of Defence wanted to cut the Royal Marines' two amphibious assault ships, HMS uh, Albion and HMS Bulwark, of which I've had the pleasure of, of serving. And I can tell you that if the Royal Marines lose their amphibious assault ships, they won't, we won the battle, don't calm down, um, Norway's defense will be affected. So what the decisions that Norway makes affect us. So, given your sovereign wealth fund, Norway, pull your finger out and spend 2% GDP now because your allies need you to. End of story. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, the, the, the title of this session is, is, is Europe without the US. I would have even gone as far as to say you could call it Europe without the US or the UK. Because the paradox of Britain is we can defend ourselves. And I'm about to explain why. What we can't do is defend Poles and Eastern Europeans and others very well. In fact, the problem of NATO is not a North American problem. It's not an Eastern or Central European problem. 
It's a Western European problem. The problem is in Western Europe. Now, as you know, the NATO exercise uh, steadfast defender, Britain will send 20,000 troops, but that's everything. Under the NATO regional defense plan, the British Army is meant to stand up within 60 days two heavy divisions. Dream on. Those days are over. Uh, you could lose the entire British Army regulars these days in Wembley Stadium. Um, there'd be an awful lot of empty seats um, still left over. Um, the army is too small, and I think we all know that. At the same time, we are deploying the carrier strike group with HMS uh, Prince of Wales at the core. Now, we were going to deploy HMS Queen Elizabeth, but she's broken down, which I apologize for, bit of a cock up. Um, but the Prince of Wales will be the core of a very influential and impressive strike group, which, you know, the Royal Navy can just about put together with a stretch. But the fact is we do have this capability. So it's something good for Europeans to have. And by the way, if Trump is elected, I have a cunning plan to sail the Queen Elizabeth or the Prince of Wales into New York, as we did recently, and invite him to give a speech on the stern of this 75,000 ton aircraft carrier with the white ensign billowing out behind him and it'll be saying, here the Brits are showing they can do this stuff. Where are the rest of you Europeans? So just, just be warned, that's, 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 <laughs> that, that, that's coming. So let me just, as it were, I've got six minutes left, deal with some core facts. The 2024 UK defense budget is 51.7 billion pounds or 70 billion dollars. Uh, that's 2.08% of GDP, rising to 2.2% GDP confirmed uh, by 27, 2027, which will be about $80 billion a year. The 10-year equipment budget, Karl Heinz, is £242 billion. So 100, 100 billion euros? Chicken feed. Chicken feed. Um, but here's the issue. The capital spending plan for the British Armed Forces is, will increase by 62% between 2021 and 2028. But the nuclear share of the 10-year equipment plan is, will rise from 25% to 34%. Now this stuff, if I can make my device work, is hugely important because the essential dilemma that Britain faces at the moment is we can field a very capable conventional force or we can put together a very powerful bespoke nuclear force, deterrent force. But on the current budget, we can't afford both. And that's the essential dilemma that the British face. So, for example, the Royal Navy will receive eight new Type 26 destroyers, which are currently being built, plus Type 31 frigates, which are also being built. Uh, they're receiving the new astute class nuclear attack submarines and the four new dreadnought class nuclear ballistic missile submarines are also currently being built, together with a new nuclear warhead currently being designed and built at the Aldermaston Atomic Weapons Research establishment. The Navy is getting more strike aircraft and air defense for the carrier strike group, which includes the new uh, nuclear attack submarines. The RAF will get at least 75 F-35 Bravos. We bought the wrong damn F-35s. We should have put cats and traps in our carriers in the first place. But the likelihood is we will go over 100 F-35s. Uh, there are 115 Typhoon Tranche 3 aircraft coming into service, plus we are developing the new Tempus uh, Future combat air, combat air System with the Japanese uh, and the Italians. But one, one aside on this, I'm always stunned that there are two FCAS programs in Europe. Uh, we really need to kind of uh, have one Future Combat Air System that is a European uh, solution to this. 
We also have purchased eight Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft, mainly to protect the nuclear deterrent as they ingress and egress from sea, three Wedgetail uh, E-7 early warning aircraft, uh, plus 20, 20, 22 new A-400Ms, as well as new medium helicopters, and a host of loitering and swarm drones. And of course, ammunition stocks will be replaced and a new generation of combined US-UK small military satellites are currently uh, being launched. So what you're gonna get from the Brits is a small, high-end, highly maneuverable, uh, what we would call a strategic raider force that can kick down doors and cause a whole amount of crap. But it can't stay there very long. And that's for those of you Europeans who don't invest in this kind of stuff. You're the ones who have to stay because we'll have to take our, 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 our force out. And we're going to have this new bespoke uh, ballistic missile deterrent capability. So the important message that I think Norwegians have to take away is that Britain remains a very capable power uh, indeed and will continue to do so but it's going to have to make some fairly profound choices on what its contribution to the alliance can be. Because if you look at the mix of naval power, air power, and land power with the new restructured army, no one's going to threaten Britain. And my fear for my country at the moment is that it's very easy for the British to withdraw onto our nuclear armed island. No one's gonna threaten us. We have superb intelligence capabilities. Um, we are quite capable of dealing with the Russians in our own backyard. The real question then becomes, what do you want us to do to defend our fellow Europeans? And what are we gonna get back in return? And that's exactly why, with due respect to your prime minister, he cannot fudge that issue of 2% with what you heard this morning. So with 24 seconds to go, I declare and resign. <laughs> Thank you, Julian, very much. Um, I was waiting for an even longer list of armaments that you would tell us. Can't, can't, can't afford them, Steve. Where were the slides? <laughs> I wanted the slides. Um, so we have in front of us a really good group of people. You've heard a bit about their perspectives. We haven't talked too much about the title, which is Europe Without America. I mean, it's out there. I mean, personally, I think without is a bit strong. Less America, that's the issue. Yeah. And so the first question I just want to pose to anyone and everyone is the nuclear deterrent question. Um, I personally don't worry so much about the Americans having the weapons. I worry more about the decision to use them, but that's a whole other decision, but Camille, you began to talk about the French deterrent having a European aspect, but it's not that big. Um, it's always meant to be, as I remember, all azimuth, which meant it was supposed to deter Washington as well, <laughs> and, <laughs> and certainly the Germans, um, but the British isn't that big either and depends very much on American technology also. So is there an answer to a European nuclear deterrent without America or with an America that has doubts about its commitment to NATO? After all, Trump used to talk about those very aggressive Montenegrins getting us all into war, right? Um, so, Camille, do, do you want to begin? And, and it raises the question for Germany, too, which is Let one of the great neuralgic questions for Germany. But, Camille, why don't you start? In first point, 
And, and there, I think we have to be very clear and, and open, including in what we say collectively. Today, the NATO documents, which are public and open, state, number one, that U.S. strategic forces provide a deterrence to, to, to Europe, and that extended U.S. deterrence is, is of uh, uh, critical importance. It also says, since 1974, that uh, the British and French independent nuclear forces uh, uh, provide a deter have a deterrent value of their own. Yeah. And that has been the case, and we all agreed to that uh, since 1974. So if we disagree about it when it, the, the proposition is being tested, we have to be a bit careful. So that's, that's important to state that. The French and British approach were slightly different for a number of historical reasons I won't go back into, but both were grounded in the same initial proposition, which is precisely should the U.S. extended deterrence fail, there would be other centers of decision that would tell Moscow, beware, you know, it doesn't suffice to have Washington vanishing from the European security scene, there are alternatives there. Having stated this, which is a very important starting point, because if we fail to recognize that we've been, rec we've been collectively admitting that those two forces were important and played a role, we now need to um, understand, in the scenario you're describing, how would that work? My sense is that it requires an honest and much deeper conversation than the one we've, we're, we've had so far. Number one, there is a conversation with the US, uh, which is okay if, God forbid, there is a decision to diminish the degree of nuclear commitment to Europe, you know, for instance, in the form of US forward presence or whatever. What, is, what does remain? What is there? Is there a sort of ultimate guarantee that remains and all of that is, and that would be a very important element in the picture. Number two, there is a question for Paris and London. And I would argue there that the question for London is more about capabilities because of the single deterrent uh, being uh, a, a at sea. Uh, and for Paris, more a doctrinal conversation of, okay, how can you be out of the nuclear planning group? How can you have not a, a proper conversation with, with the other allies? Uh, and yeah. what are you really, re what do you mean by there is a European dimension to your vital interest? How do you operationalize that statement in practice? Are you ready to forward deploy assets uh, in crisis time, in peacetime? Uh, what do you say for this? Currently, the French answer is not no. The French answer is it's all in the hands of the president because of a doctrinal sort of purity that vital interests are by definition owned by the president which is not that far from British or, or American views, but uh, is, uh, uh, probably needs to be refined uh, uh, further. Mm -hmm. Then there is a question to the non-nuclear allies, and I'll stop mm -hmm. there, uh, which is that the non-nuclear allies have to clarify what is it that they expect, what is it that they're ready to contribute in the mission, including in its non-nuclear dimension, how uh, uh, vocal are they ready to be, and here let me take a cheap shot at Norway, when it comes to uh, the, the nuclear ban treaty, for instance, you know, uh, are we really collectively clear that deterrence is really critically important for us, uh, our policy? You know, th those are points that we need to be much clearer about collectively. And on that basis, I would argue that we are in a different situation, and I alluded to that in my remarks so I can be quick, than in the Cold War days, where there were tens of thousands of Soviet weapons that we were contemplating a protracted nuclear war in Europe, you know, we're more talking about some, some sort of existential messaging to Moscow that any use of nuclear weapons would be so, uh, would transform the nature of the conflict so deeply that Paris and London couldn't stay out of that, even if Washington was hesitant to, to commit. That's, I think this is where we are, but I think we need a more honest and open conversation about this because I think each of the players have something to bring to this yeah. conversation. I mean, Joe, let me, I mean, I'll put it in the blundest yeah, please do. journalistic way. Do you want to trade London for Lithuania? No. Though I do like Lithuania. <laughs> no. <laughs> no but, um, look, the devil's in the detail, Steve, with these nuclear questions. Um, with the new dreadnought class submarines, the UK will increase warheads from 192 to somewhere over 300. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now, the missiles are drawn under the Bermuda Agreement from the same pool as the US Atlantic Fleet, the Ohio-class submarines. The deal is such that the US cannot stop that. So, you know, these are effectively British missiles being serviced by, by the US pool. Mm -hmm. The new warheads are British, the fire control systems are British. That's in the worst possible nightmare, which I couldn't possibly imagine, the US would suddenly deny that, some kind of a McMahon Act. Um, well, you see the, 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 the satellites being launched from the new space center in Scotland. Um, it wouldn't take that long, I'm sure, if we might work with France on this, to develop a new ballistic missile capability. Um, so I don't, I, you know, the, the British nuclear deterrent is assured for 40 years. The issue for me, very quickly, is given the changing nature of anti-ship and anti-submarine technology with artificial intelligence, drones, undersea systems, can these big bespoke ballistic missile submarines remain hidden? Yeah, that's right. Um, that's going to be the, you know, because the, the dreadnoughts will come into service early 2030s, and they'll still be in service early 2060s. Mm -hmm. So we Europeans need to be looking out beyond that. Now, the point about the nuclear thing is that London and Paris do speak to each other about these things. Uh, and it's very sensitive. But there is coordination between the two countries on this. And the other allies tend to adopt the view, well, we know you have them, but we won't ask too many questions. Right. Right. Because that, in a sense, is part of the multiple decision-making centers concept, right. which underpins deterrence. In because, I mean, I mean, just to Justina, one of the big questions in Poland, at least under the old government, was we don't trust anyone else's deterrent except the Americans. So let's hang tight with Uncle Sam, because without the American nuclear deterrent, let alone presence, no one's going to come save us. I mean, is that a fair assessment, or is it changing? Is it different under? Uh, well, I, I think you, you have a point there, and it's, uh, in my opinion, it's not only the perspe perspective of the the old peace government, but possibly also the new um, uh, civic platform led uh, government, that the US is the main ally and the US nuclear deterrence is the most credible one. Yeah. Let's imagine scenarios uh, uh, um, with uh, Russian nuclear pressure or use of nuclear weapon. And uh, let's imagine uh, European uh, decisions or European discussions uh, about uh, using uh, new, uh, U, uh, UK or, or French uh, nuclear weapons uh, without the US. That will be very difficult yeah. discussions, yeah. Uh, of which outcome uh, is uh, pretty unsure. Yeah. 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 And uh, therefore, I think from the Polish perspective, to avoid the nuclear dilemmas, and I think this is the Eastern Flank perspective of uh, non-nuclear countries, is to raise the conventional deterrence yeah. in order not to let uh, the Russians uh, um, even think about uh, invading uh, any of the NATO Eastern Flank countries and then pose us uh, with uh, dilemmas um, whether we uh, stage a collective defense operation when Russians are threatening uh, with the use of nuclear weapons against us. Good, good. This has happened in Ukraine. No? We saw the nuclear uh, um, uh, black mail uh, of, of the Russians, yeah, which, the was, which was efficient, right. which was efficient and yeah. which uh, deter, uh, deterred our um, uh, farther uh, or far-reaching uh, military support from the US especially and from other Europeans. So I think from our perspective, the goal should be to raise uh, conventional deterrence uh, especially and to raise this European component uh, of conventional uh, deterrence uh, on the eastern flank and raise the forward uh, presence of the uh, NATO forces uh, in the Baltic States and in Poland. And therefore, the uh, German uh, brigade in Lithuania is so important. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the Canadian-led uh, uh, brigade that should materialize at some stage as well with uh, the Swedish component and with, uh, with other nations joining in is so important. Okay, and um, there are questions about Estonia with what you mentioned, the uh, depleted uh, capability of the British Army, which is not able to, uh, to field a 
and to deploy a brigade right. uh, to uh, Estonia, and which which shows very well yeah. the lack of uh, uh, capabilities. Yeah. Uh, capabilities. So oh, I think Thank this you. is the issue where we should concentrate. Okay, and then for for Germany, this is always a question. I mean, you have bombs that are supposed to go on German planes. Now, whether that is still the thing to do in an age of missiles and submarines, who knows, but it binds Germany in a way to the alliance. But there's also now the sky shield idea, which is let's shoot them down before they arrive. So, I mean, is this an open discussion in Germany or just among the elite? Is it a real discussion? What do you think? Well, first, I am fairly optimistic with regard to this entire nuclear deterrence thing from a German point of view. First, interesting to see that this Zeitenwende mm -hmm. also took place with regard to nuclear weapons in the heads and minds of Germany. I wouldn't have expected mm. this. In June 22, four months after the beginning of the war, a German poll found out that 52% of the Germans are supporting U.S. nuclear presence on German soil. 65% of these supporters were voters of the Greens. Mm -hmm. I would have never expected <laughs> this. This didn't happen in the last 40 years. All polls are difficult, but it just gives you the direction that the people understood something is going on there which we have to be careful about. Second point, should the U.S. nuclear extended deterrence collapse completely, which I don't believe to happen, it cannot be replaced by a European version of extended nuclear deterrence because France, for good reasons, by the way, by definition, rejects the idea of, of extended deterrence. France says nuclear weapons are national weapons. La nucléaire ne se partage pas. You cannot divide the nuclear, which is a logical reasoning, but if this is the case, you cannot, by definition, cannot be any replacement for U.S. nuclear deterrence. And third, let's assume for a second that the U.S. nuclear deterrence disappears completely because Trump says, I don't do this anymore or whatever. Even then, by the way, Trump could, uh, even then Putin couldn't be completely sure about this guy, what he really thinks. But then the idea of these two independent decision-making centers are important. Mm. Because what is, the question is not whether Julian wants to risk London for the Baltics or whether Camille is willing to risk Paris for Berlin. We don't know whether the US is willing to risk San Francisco for Warsaw or for Berlin. And I don't want to find out, by the way. Uh, the important thing is that Putin cannot exclude this. And sure. Putin cannot, could not exclude any decisive reaction from these two centers, even if the third one is out. Is this my preferred scenario? Not at all. No, of course. But this is certainly one which, is, um, which, which gives me some, uh, uh, some relaxation. And on these goddamn bombs, I mean, the, the, the bombs in Germany are not stationed there because they make sense. Be right. Because this is the, these are the, the, the systems which were the leftovers after all cuts in the 90s. Yeah. And now we will not, of course, we should deeply discuss in NATO, if, if we start discussing NATO uh, nuclear issues in NATO seriously, then the question come up, are these weapons the right ones? Yeah. Do they have to be stationed in Germany and not better in Poland, mm -hmm. geostrategically? Uh, but NATO is currently not doing this discussion. My, my, my strong uh, encouragement would be to take this onto the agenda of Washington, to come up to a new deterrence and defense posture review. The last nuclear strategic document in NATO is the, defense, the deterrence and defense posture review. It is as complicated as the title is. You don't want to read this. It's from the year 2012, yeah, right. when Russia was still a partner, when we had dreams about sort of the Arab Spring. Yeah. Okay, the Poles never believed it's a partner, but, by, did I. but officially never. it was a partner. And when China was regarded to be benevolent. Sure. So nothing is, NATO needs to have this, this, uh, this discussion urgently on the nuts and balls of deterrence. I mean, the, the, real, the, 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 the real question for non-nuclear allies comes down to the dual-capable aircraft. Um, going forward with the F-35s, it is feasible to think that there would be non-nuclear allies carrying nuclear systems 
uh, as part of a deterrent posture of the alliance because NATO is a nuclear alliance. Sure. We have a nuclear planning group. So just don't talk about it. Just don't talk about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Come here, you just, want, uh, just to add a couple of thoughts to this very interesting conversation. Number one, I think the primary intent is of any nuclear, and I agree with uh, Karl Heinz on the value of having a deterrence uh, and, and defense posture review that just looks at that, the nitty gritty, the balance between conventional missile defense and, deter and, and nuclear deterrence. Uh, uh, it's an interesting question in the current environment. I think it's worthwhile a, a conversation at 32. Uh, it is also, so all these things are, are sort of relevant uh, uh, elements of the conversation because indeed, if we don't have a robust conventional capabilities, uh, the risks of seeing the nuclear deterrent being tested are higher and, uh, and then it creates more stress for those who are, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and as we know, reassurance is more complicated than, than deterrence sometimes. Uh, second, second point I wanted to add is, it's a sort of a bit counterintuitive initially, but on the role of London and Paris, it is hard to imagine a situation where Europe would be a, under an overwhelming attack and both these countries would not see that as um, existential. Yeah. That's uh, which makes it somewhat easier in terms of, of, of commitment than seeing it from a, a Washington that could feel isolated. But of course the problem isn't if Europe's under overwhelming attack, the problem is if there's one bomb on a NATO country. That's a different. No, but I, and I, I would argue that it's you know, and, and then anyway, we, we can have a, you know again. I don't. I'm not. I, we're not going to put ourselves in the shoes of the leaders, but the the, the clear element in this is to to uh, how do we operationalize that? And I think the, the issue is it's going to be if it was to happen, it would be different from the U.S. model. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I would say, just to echo point Julian made about the Franco-British conversation, which is very deep and has been happening for many years just to say in passing that this conversation is happening with a number of non-nuclear allies yeah. already. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, bilaterally, quietly, discreetly, there are, there are allies who said they want to learn more about you know, the French posture and how it works. That's happening. You know, uh, and, and this is something that you know, was happening. Uh, one public example, which was interesting because it was with a civic platform, is a Franco-Polish document that goes back to 2012, I guess, uh, and the fact that there was a bilateral high-level statement by both countries specifically on nuclear deterrent uh, that had a specific paragraph on nuclear deterrent says something, you know, you don't put these statements just out of randomly. Yeah, absolutely. Justina. Uh, one point that I would like to, uh, to, uh, to add to this discussion. Uh, nuclear um, or discussion um, about and co uh, conversation about nuclear deterrence is difficult in NATO because of the European publics that uh, uh, we are, uh, that are very re re reluctant to acknowledge that NATO is a nuclear uh, alliance. We do uh, need uh, a review of uh, uh, NATO's nuclear posture, but it's, uh, um, there is also a different element that is uh, particularly important from our perspective. As you know, uh, Poland, uh, or at least the old government, uh, wanted to um, take part in the nuclear sharing agreements. Uh, and uh, the issue was why this discussion has been calmed down and not taken up politically um, was basically the, uh, the question of uh, Russia-NATO uh, founding act mm -hmm. um, uh, being still in place and limiting um, NATO's or allied uh, actions or progress or developments in this regard. And uh, this comes back to what I've said uh, previously about uh, the alliance or particular allies not uh, still not grasping uh, the uh, point of time or the change of uh, security environment that we are right now in. NATO-Russia founding act limited uh, the conventional and nuclear presence uh, on uh, the eastern flank since, 1990, uh, right. since right. the new, new right. members joined NATO. Right. Conventional limitation has been formally um, uh, are not in place with the brigades uh, to be stationed right. in the Baltic states, but uh, nuclear limitations are still there. 
Okay. And uh, neither the US nor the European allies would like to, uh, to denounce the Russia-NATO uh, founding act mm -hmm. uh, so that it could uh, enable um, a real conversation about uh, non-nuclear allies on the eastern flank, flank to, to join uh, nuclear uh, sharing arrangements. Mm -hmm. I, and I think this is uh, also one of the um, key and substantial points that we try to discuss in the alliance. So how, we, how do we view Russia uh, uh, in the future? Because I think uh, in spite of all the talk about Russia as a threat, uh, I think some still believe that uh, a comeback, uh, or at least a partial comeback to Russia, a Russian NATO founding act, can still be possible. And I think this yes. is a, yes. a, a very problem a uh, um, that uh, we, fa we face in NATO and is related to this nuclear question yeah. uh, and um, impacts that. Steve, but that's a whole, sorry, go ahead. Just Your point if, about yeah. if the, 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 the title of the session should be Europe without America, but Europe with less America. Mm -hmm. Surely that is the mitigation strategy that we Europeans should be considering for Washington. Um, what is it that the United States will expect reasonably from us yeah. to maintain the U.S. commitment? And there are, to me, there are two uh, areas of conventional force development that we need to focus on. One is maintaining interoperability with the U.S. forces going forward, um, including in high end. Because interoperability is a word that's bandied around, but in fact, it only really means the ability to operate together when under extreme duress during... Uh, high-end conflict. <coughs> we can do the rest, yeah. but that's the real test. And, more, and if Europeans do not realize that, then I'm afraid that will weaken the very ability of American forces to work with us without increasing their own risk. The thing I would take to Washington, above all else, which won't be taken, is the offer to create a European allied mobile heavy force. Uh, that should the Americans be engaged elsewhere <coughs> can act as a reinforcement of deterrence, conventional deterrence, looking northeast mm -hmm. and southeast. Tanks. Uh, basically, but also other uh, aspects. But for that, you need the very... Under the new NATO force model, we would need Europeans, we would need 50 to 60 brigades, well-equipped, uh, if not at high readiness, kept it, I think the phrase is high alert. Right. Um, at the moment, we have 20 to 30. So if we can go to the US with that kind of offer mm -hmm. of a improved interoperability and higher readiness brigades, mm -hmm. i.e. fulfilling the family of plans objectives already agreed, right. then that, to me, will ensure that... Yeah. The, no, because, I mean, I think, um, as people have said, <laughs> under or no Trump, um, America wants Europe to do more, expects yeah. Europe to do more. We've got other things to do, other fish to fry, so, so to speak. Um, but it, it, it just makes me wonder, I, I can't help but asking Camille, what would President Le Pen's view be about <laughs> NATO, Ukraine, and the nuclear deterrent? I mean, I mean first of all, and not that we know, but not that we know. But no, first of all, um, first first caveat, and I, I I love the no, I don't love. I hate the Le Pen conversation, but but it is a conversation for in three years from now. So, yes. so it's slightly different from the Trump conversation, if I may put it this way. Well, that's only one uh, year uh, from uh, now. Of, in terms of, of Trump you know, Le Pen summit. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that that's the first point. <laughs> Uh, but indeed, there are issues in France, like in other uh, European countries, with the rise of parties that are, to put it gently, skeptic about NATO, uh, Russia leaning on, some, on a number of issues, uh, and keen to have a, a Europe that is, a, a, you know, not operating at least as it does operate today, uh, whether in NATO or the EU. Of course, in terms of outcome, there are two possible outcomes. There is one which we are seeing at least favorably from the security uh, uh, angle, which is a sort of Melonio out outcome. I'm going to do pursue my domestic agenda, but when it comes to NATO, and by the way, the EU, I'm sort of sticking to my commitments and I'm being there. I don't necessarily see Marine Le Pen being on that line, but there are other variants of the French 
far right or very conservative right uh, that would end up uh, pretty much on, on that. And then there is the, the, the moment where the, the agenda becomes how do I uh, you know, rock the boat on, on these issues. And it is extremely problematic indeed uh, to, to look at that. Uh, so I, again, I would say never too early to worry, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, and then there are two, two different outcomes of that. I think the damage for the European Union is likely to be stronger uh, than the damage for, for NATO, because I think for NATO there is a sort of mitigation. Uh, uh, there, are, there are ways to sort of mitigate a declining commitment from a medium-sized European ally. Okay. Only one sentence to add from another <laughs> national perspective, since I happen to live in Italy. When Meloni came to power, we had the same concerns. Mm -hmm. Oh, a right-wing lady dealing with the Lega Nord, Berlusconi sees himself as a personal friend of Putin, and so on and so forth. This is now the most serious yeah. and experienced and capable government Italy had for many years. Okay, the competition is not high, I agree. I was going to say. But, uh, <laughs> it, is, um, it is still something which is, which is positive, so no, no. we might be surprised. No, no, it's good. So just to ask you if... If, if you don't mind. I mean, we all love the Zeitenbender, and at first we thought, oh, this is going to be spent quickly, and then it turned out, no, it was going to be spent over a parliament. Um, but Germans understood this as spending money on the German military, because it had become rather ridiculously inefficient. Um, but when I look at the polls, Germans are very reluctant to get involved militarily elsewhere. <coughs> they still want diplomatic solutions, thinking of the last Kerber poll, but there are an awful lot of them. Um, and on Ukraine, certainly in the beginning, there was this great fear, you know, the war's coming here, right? Um, and now it's pretty clear the war's not coming to Germany, it's going to be kept in Ukraine, we think. And it's like the alarm clock went off, and in my line, they've hit the snooze button in, in Germany. Um, and Pistorius is trying to set the alarm again. But is it, I mean, is the Zeitenwende really a turning point, or is it a moment that is receding? That's the question. That was the standard question we were always asked in the Ministry of Defense when we got external, external groups <laughs> by saying, is the Zeitenwende lasting? Yeah. Yeah, or yeah. will the pendulum swill, uh, swing back? Uh, with all its deficiencies, and it's never a perfect thing, I think the Zeitenwende is lasting for three reasons. First, it was made by a red-green government, yes. mm -hmm. which is a fundamental change, and having seen how much these governments struggled, and they are still struggling with their... With with the electorate, which is not completely convinced, uh, is already remarkable. Second point, why it's lasting, we have a fundamental agreement in Parliament on supporting Ukraine. A bipartisan majority, which I hardly saw on any other issues in the recent decades. And even at the fringes, at the Wagenknecht, there are some people asking, mm, supporting Russia is not always a good, a good idea. So we have discussions on the how and how much and the Taurus yes or the Taurus no, mm -hmm. but the basic understanding is there. Third point, why I think it's lasting, we have a different understanding in the public. And I don't think that the snooze button has been pressed, and I don't think that this idea of that the concern, the threat perception is not there yet. Because this, I, this, this is why Scholz mm -hmm. is so careful, rightly or wrongly, yeah, yeah. on this escalation thing. But he's certainly reflecting German opinion. Exactly, yeah. but the Germans also realize, and this is why the Zeitenwende took place at all, because people realize it is not Afghanistan. It is damn close. The distance between northern Germany and Munich is the same then from Berlin to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So this feeling of an immediate threat, not that the people don't sleep bad at night, but it is something different in your threat perception. And this is why we have still a, an overall support for sanctions against mm -hmm. Russia, Absolutely. although the prices are rising and the people mm -hmm. feel it, uh, and for further supporting Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that now a chancellor from a 
deeply pacifist arms control party, SPD, is now the driver in the EU for putting more money for Ukraine is the hell of a change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and also simply the shift away from Russian fossil fuels is pretty remarkable. It is, I mean, it is, it is remarkable. It's very painful. It's, it, it, is remarkable. it must be said. It is not done yet. In no, one there's apart. still a lot of LNG coming in, exactly. let alone coal. Exactly. And still we have a lot of problems. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of public protest. This is why a part of our rising of the, extreme, of the populist right yeah. is not so much anti-Semitism. Yes, there are. Mm -hmm. But mostly is this, this, this feeling about the government is not dealing well with my concerns. I have yeah. to pay well, more is, and have to change the heat. Sure. This is a whole other conversation which, which we probably shouldn't have here, but I mean, it always fascinates me that... And let's not have it. No, but I mean, <laughs> I, I'm just very intrigued by how much the far right supports Israel. It's not because they have particularly affection for Jews, but this is another way of talking about Islam and migration. Absolutely. And that's a whole other question, but I think is worth saying. Um, I want the audience to start thinking of questions. We've got about 20 minutes left, and I'd love to take a couple round of, of um, questions. Um, and while you're thinking, I'm just gonna ask one more, really. Does Poland have more confidence in this Germany than before, do you think? <laughs> well, I think um, acknowledging all that uh, Germany has done so far, I think one needs to ask a question whether the glass is uh, half full or, ha or half empty. And from my perspective, it's half empty and in three, three areas, uh, Ukraine and strategy towards this war. Um, and I'm not talking uh, about all of Germany, but uh, I'm talking about the Chancellery, whether the understanding um, is the same in Berlin and the Chancellery as it is in Warsaw, in which moment of history we are, and I doubt it is. Um, the narrative on uh, Russia uh, cannot uh, win this war and uh, Ukraine cannot lose it uh, is not a, na a narrative that uh, shows uh, uh, towards a Ukrainian victory. It uh, points rather towards a kind of a settlement uh, of the conflict, uh, which uh, from, our pers from my perspective is uh, hardly possible. Uh, is, um, uh, there is a lot of hopes uh, about that, but still, um, and shows that uh, Berlin still does not fully understand the character of, of the Putin regime uh, in Russia and its strategic goals. So this is the first area. Second area, defense uh, budget. Acknowledging the 100 billion uh, for defense, I see um, uh, this debate ongoing in Germany about long-term defense spending. And I think it is worrying because uh, the regular German defense budget, it's at 50, uh, 50 billion euros, which means 1.5, I think, percent of GDP. Uh, and there is unwillingness to raise it. So the question um, uh, is there, what uh, will happen and uh, how Germany will, uh, with uh, its regular budget, uh, will um, come to the 2% um, mark of GDP with that when the 100 billion of, uh, precisely, of uh, precisely. Uh, modernization fund is yeah. done. Spent. And also, you know, I mean, given the bureaucracy, the difficulty, it's just spending 2% is gonna be hard, but yeah. I and mean. I think another yes. issue is the state of the Bundeswehr. Yeah. Uh, and um, I try to explain how Poland envisaged uh, to develop its, uh, its uh, armed forces mm -hmm. uh, and uh, acquire new capabilities. I'm waiting for the plans uh, that should be presented by the uh, Defense Minister Pistorius in March or, or April on the Bundeswehr reform. And I will be curious whether Germany plans to substantially add uh, and expand its military capabilities or whether that will be all, only a structural reform. Because I think we need a capable German armed forces, especially in the land, uh, land di dimension, uh, to, um, uh, to support the eastern flank countries. And I'm not sure whether that will come, which shows to me that Germany is not seriously um, thinking about worst case scenarios that might happen in a few years' times, just as we uh, think about them. Particularly if there's less America, 
which well, is, goes if back there is to less, our theme. Uh, America, and uh, that adds to the yeah. picture. And of course, if Ben Hodges were here, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. he's not. He apparently has the flu. We could have a discussion about mobility and how the EU and, and NATO aren't making it, are, are, are thinking about how you get tanks to the border, but it's one of those complicated things. Some of us Let's, are. Sorry? Some of us are thinking about it. Well, I know, but I mean, <laughs> it's like laws have to be changed, railways have to be changed, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Let's get some questions. I mean, I know there are, there are microphones in the hall. Could I just ask you just, it's sometimes hopeless, but please identify yourself and please ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Adam Halvorsen, Norwegian Ship Owners Association. Uh, so in a Europe, not without the US, but with less US, and a NATO with less US, to what extent and in which direction does that influence respective national positions on conditions and timeline for Ukrainian NATO membership? Okay. Thank you. Let's question from, I, from Ian, and then I'll take one more, and then we'll go back to the panel. Okay. The gentleman had ex almost exactly the same question I wanted to have. But you ahead. haven't asked it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Brzezinski from the Atlantic Council. The Vilnius summit, it was a near miss to getting Ukraine a clear path to NATO membership. There are only really two countries that really opposed it. It was Germany and the United States. Where will the UK, Poland, Germany, and France stand on this issue as we run up to this summit? Okay. Let's get one, one more, possibly, if you see a hand. There's a hand way in the back. Okay, great. Please. Uh, so, Philip Bedos-Sylvin. I come from the Norwegian NGO No to Nuclear Weapons. And it seems like uh, in the discussion, Dr. Lindley French said it himself, that you cannot really, at least Britain cannot spend both on nuclear weapons and conventional forces and provide a credible deterrent for Europe in itself. Um, so my question is, has the reliance on the nuclear deterrent and the nuclear umbrella hindered European allies in prioritizing its conventional forces and deterrence? And is this what we now must pay for? Very good question. Good question. So who would like to... Shall I start off with the nuclear okay, question? Okay, go ahead. That's, a, that's an excellent question on the nuclear. Look, the annual cost to the UK defense budget of the running costs of the Vanguard class submarines and the nuclear deterrent is 6% per annum. And yes, that 6% could be spent elsewhere, particularly when, you know, the relationship between ends, ways and means is a tight relationship, uh, given the commitments of the forces in, in various places. Um, the stupid thing from the British perspective, well, I think it was stupid, was that Prior to 2010, the deterrent was paid from for the National Contingency Reserve. So it was outside the defense budget. Right. But the Cameron Osborne government brought it inside the defense budget, immediately effectively cutting the conventional force by, with the capital cost, about 12%. So I think what's going to happen, and this is a debate in London right now, is that the uh, cost of the deterrent will be taken out of the defense budget and we'll again have a defense budget which is entirely conventional. The more interesting debate from my point of view is not whether we're going to afford them or not, we are, is d investing so much in extremely expensive bespoke nuclear power ballistic missile platforms when the development of hypersonic technology, cruise technology, glide missile technology, artificial intelligence, drone, sw uh, you know, uh, 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 drone swarms is developing at such a pace, would it not make more sense for Britain to have more um, nuclear-powered attack submarines that are nuclear-capable? Because then we'd have more operational utility out of those investments. And that is a, deba a debate that's going on. And of course, the money invested in the Dreadnought class, 41 billion pounds, is already, as it were, perhaps this is the wrong phrase, sunk. Yes. Um, so uh, <laughs> um, so that's, that would be my response. As to Ukraine, the UK will back Ukrainian membership. Although I'm extremely concerned 
that we are simply heading towards a situation where we're kind of accepting that Russia is going to hold on to Donbass and Crimea and Ukraine will get the consolation prize or the rest of Ukraine of some kind of NATO membership over a period. If that is indeed the settlement, then at the very least it has to be that a Ukraine without the Donbass and Crimea must be brought into the alliance straight away. And certainly the UK would back Ukrainian membership. Right. Right, right, right. The, uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> on the Ukraine uh, membership, um, in, in Vilnius we had the opposition from the US and from Germany, from the US primarily because of the cost, and from Germany cost plus this old, old idea, Kanzler and Chancellery's idea of not offending the Russians too much. Mm -hmm. The cost argument is a serious one. Because Ukrainian membership in the past, that's why we had this discussion in 2008 in Bucharest, Ukrainian membership means to defend Ukraine at its eastern borders, yep. which is 1,300 kilometers away from Polish eastern borders. And NATO has already problems enough to defend Polish eastern borders. So the cost argument is serious. I think or I hope that in the run-up to the summit, this argument becomes weaker. It becomes weaker because of two reasons. First, Ukraine has a strong, capable military force, combat hardened, sad to say, mm -hmm. in the meantime, so their capacity to contribute significantly to their own defense of their own borders is much higher than it was in 21 or whenever. And second, as I said earlier, Russia gets weaker. So the requirement of pure military defense gets less. Whether this tickles down in the Chancellor's office till July, I honestly don't know. Yeah, yeah. But the public debate we have, uh, no one in 2014 was seriously, uh, was seriously discussing about Ukraine. Yeah. There's something, Ukraine, my goodness. Uh, but now there is this broad discussion also in the political spectrum that there has to be, some, there has to be done something seriously on Ukraine on the summit, whether it's an invitation, whether it's a different wording of not saying we are interested in Ukraine, but Ukrainian security is of vital interest for NATO. That would be something in the, in, uh, there would be something in the declaration that there has to be something, that has to be done something serious, I think is very clear. Whether it is enough for an invitation, I'm not sure but at least for a significant step forward compared to Vilnius. I mean, I just clarify. I mean, I, mean I, I would just add one sentence to the American view, yeah. which is Biden's view. He also thinks Ukraine is corrupt. He's not happy with the state of democracy and he feels Ukraine isn't ready yet. And he's kind of hoping the EU will do a lot to fix these problems before NATO membership comes up. But, you, you know, this is an old, you know, Biden's been thinking about Ukraine, worried about Ukraine, this isn't just about his son, which was corrupt enough, but um, he just doesn't think it's yep. ready. The same uh, was it in yeah. Germany, I mean, in 2008, Chancellor Merkel, by the way, was not the only one who, uh, who opposed, there were eight other NATO countries opposing it, exactly for this reason, yeah. because Ukraine was not a bargain at that time, let's face it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a clarification. But even this yeah. argument goes down now yeah. after this country is defending itself yes, for democracy, and we are, we are defending our democracy up to the last Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is something which certainly gets noticed. I mean, just very quickly, my concern about what I just said about NATO membership linked to Donbass and Crimea is that the barrier of a country at war joining the alliance would be quickly removed if Ukraine was no longer at war having given up the Donbass and Crimea. And therefore there's a paradox of operating, offering early NATO membership, which is accepting a peace which they will not be happy with. Yeah. Mm. Um, Polish position on uh, Ukraine's membership uh, in NATO is that Ukraine should get an invitation to NATO, uh, but the time frame and the condition of uh, the membership uh, shall not be settled, uh, um, as we don't yeah. know how the situation will, uh, will uh, evolve. Mm. Uh, the invitation is important because it, it shows to Russia that uh, we are serious, that we want to draw a line uh, against uh, Russian ambitions of uh, conquering and subordinating Ukraine. 
But at the same time, um, this is the position of Poland, Eastern flank countries, uh, some partners in Europe, but I don't think um, some allies think seriously about Ukraine's uh, NATO membership. Yeah. Um, and I have heard and I get the impression that even in the scenario that you have outlined, uh, meaning uh, there is a settlement, which I don't believe uh, there will be, uh, because Russia does not want Crimea and, uh, Crimea and does not uh, want Donbas, it wants all of Ukraine, uh, that uh, even as in such a scenario, imagined one, uh, there will be considerations about uh, granting uh, NATO membership uh, to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and that might be um, uh, a question uh, or, or an issue uh, to be discussed with the Russians. Yeah, and the outcome yeah, of these discussions is pretty obvious to me. So I think uh, what it needs uh, to bring Ukraine to NATO, and for me, this is the only way to make Eastern European or Eastern Europe secure and, pe uh, and, and at mm -hmm. peace, is Ukraine uh, winning this war, defeating Russia, regime change in Russia. That would um, make the uh, um, security uh, environment and the situation that enables Ukraine to join NATO. Uh, Okay. That will be difficult, but I think difficult. that will be that is the only uh, possible way that I see uh, of Ukraine joining mm -hmm. NATO. Because even if, if in a situation we offer NATO membership to Ukraine, uh, if we have a peace, uh, a, a temporary settlement of the conflict, Russia will prevent it at every cost, or will try to prevent it at every cost. So I don't think this is the scenario mm -hmm. you outlined is, is feasible. And uh, Ukraine at war with Russia in NATO is also so unfeasible. Right. So the only well, solution that I see is Ukraine winning this war uh, and uh, that will create uh, the circumstances that Ukraine okay. will be able to join the alliance. Camille. Um, jumping in on that, I think I mean, there are a few issues that we need to keep in mind when we discuss this. First of all, compare it with other solutions. The so-called porcupine model where we spend 20 or 30 billion a year to sustain a Ukraine uh, fighting Russia. You know, NATO membership is cheaper, more effective, and, and sm a smarter move. So I think it's important. Second, NATO membership, EU membership are part of Ukraine's victory. You know, I would say even no matter what are the borders, it is a defining element of victory for the Ukrainians. Their Western orientation is carved in marble. So from that perspective, I really hope that we can, in Washington, signal that we are moving on in that direction and that we, we find a way to, to make that happen because that's really important. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, the NATO and EU membership sort of need to move together. Uh, so whether, whatever the pace is. And thirdly, um, I think the issue of the land, you know, as I agree that a country at war, it's difficult to put it into an alliance. But even in the uh, case of a light ceasefire type of situation, I think we should be ready to sort of make that happen. Uh, there are lots of precedents, including the German case of a country, when Germany joined NATO, its borders were unclear, you know, and I'm talking no, about the border with Poland. Uh, the GDR existed and was not recognized, and ultimately not so long after the, the unification happened. Right. Just one word on the nuclear point, just okay. to, to answer the question very directly. Mm -hmm. In the French case, um, we're slightly more cost effective. Um, uh, because it's been a sort of long-term endeavor. Mm. It's about 0.3% of your GDP, of all GDP. So that, does that, is it this massive, not massive? It's about 10% of the defense budget. Uh, altogether, pretty cost-effective. If you look at it from, it prevents um, uh, a world war. You know, you can make the argument of whether it has prevented or not, but if you look at it from the long term, that has played a role. And second, it, in the, even in the current environment, has probably played a role in preventing escalation or the temptation of escalation from Russia. So, so I think the, the financial argument on the nuclear programs, certainly in the French case, but more overall, it's, it's one of those very cost-effective things. So I think the cost-effectiveness argument is not the one I would use right. if I were arguing yeah. against nuclear weapons. Okay. Um, which I'm not, as you noticed. Uh, but, uh, uh, the, 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 but I think it is, it is something that is very much, by the way, in the minds of French decision makers because they believe it produced more results or bigger 
bank for the buck or, or more security than the money committed to other things which can be sort of endless uh, investments. But I think it's something that is shared by a number of nuclear weapon states. Well, one thing I hope in Washington, they'll come up with a declaration that says more than we are prepared to invite Ukraine whenever we decide to invite Ukraine, which is what came out of Vilnius, which mm. didn't really convince anybody. Let's take a couple more questions, please. We are running out of time. Constanze, you have a, a microphone. Good. I grabbed it. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I would really like to stick with this question of NATO and EU membership because it's something that I have a, I have a hard time understanding. Uh, the logic of opening EU accessions in December and, and yet all our government saying there's absolutely no question of having more forward-leaning language on NATO membership in Vilnius. That, that strikes me as, as just bizarre. And then the thing that they often, that, that these senior officials then often say is, we cannot, uh, we, we cannot uh, accept a country joining that is at war. Again, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about showing that we will build a framework in which we help Ukraine change in ways that make the question of yeah. membership easily answered at the end of that transformative process, and will, which will be in parallel with the EU accession process, right? Okay. That's the same thing to do. Now, you, you said, you know, it's not clear to me that, that Poland wants uh, that kind of declaration at the, at the Washington summit, or you want it. Poland. We know that the Americans and the Germans definitely don't want any declaration of, of that kind, and I know that the French are more forward-leaning. Can you just explain what your governments actually are trying to do here? Okay, <laughs> so could you just hand the microphone? Hey, uh, Karsten Fries from Norwegian Institute of International Affairs again. Um, just want to follow up on the same again. Um, uh, this, this fear of escalation, I mean, if we can't even provide Taurus or, or long-range attackers for, you know, fear of escalation, do we really have the political guts to bring Ukraine into NATO with a nuclear extended, nuclear extended deterrence? I'm not sure, I mean, we all want it, we all think so, and we hear that in conferences, but I, it doesn't seem to me that the politicians are willing to, to take that risk. Thank you. Unfortunately, I've mismanaged the time, as usual. We have about a minute left. <laughs> so we're, we're just going to go like this, and you're going to answer 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever you want. Right. UK wants, is happy with Ukraine being given an invitation and Ukraine joining NATO. EU doesn't matter to us anymore. Um, and on the issue of do we have enough political guff, um, yes on balance. <laughs> Justina. Uh, so it's not only my opinion that, uh, Poland, uh, that um, uh, there is a need of uh, invita invitation extended to Ukraine at the Washington summit um, um, uh, in, in July. Uh, this is the Polish uh, government stance. So uh, I think we are pretty much united in Poland on, on this issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, whether, uh, even if this uh, invitation is extended, and I fully agree about the process, and then we'll see in the future, or that, that, will, uh, that can enable uh, a real membership um, in the future, when and how that, that uh, might happen uh, is an unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but we want to uh, definitely uh, start this process. Uh, but with regard to the uh, comparison between Atacams and uh, NATO membership, I think not all allies are uh, convinced. And the language from the Vilnius uh, summit reflects that uh, if all allies agree and conditions are met, this is uh, uh, an enough vague phrase uh, to extend the process indefinitely. On NATO, uh, on Ukraine membership in NATO, I think it's a moving target. In Berlin, discussion has not come to a, to a conclusion as far as I can see it. Um, no, so no decision is taken yet. And as I said, developments might go on until the summit. I'm fairly sure, though, that there is a conviction in the government that it has to be more than Vilnius. How much more and whether Ukraine will be satisfied with this more is not clear, but I think it will be more than Vilnius. Okay. And the dernier mot. Um, uh, merci. Uh, the, the, no, two things. 
I think on the, the dynamics, let me be blunt, and Ian will love this, most Europeans are looking at what, where Washington will land. You know, there are some scars of Vilnius where the, the, the Poles, the Lithuanians, tried to push it a little further, and then you know, they don't like uh, being told by Washington, Sh shut, shut up, uh, and don't. So, so I think that the, the leadership exercised by the Biden administration on this is critical. Yeah. You know, and even the French and the British, which are more forward-leaning, they are going to sort of sit in the quad and say, yeah, sure, we're going to leave with this. Uh, and, and so I think leadership from Washington is critical, even if Paris is more forward-leaning on this. Second, on the fear of escalation, let me offer a completely counterintuitive argument uh, but I believe that expanding NATO has stabilized the borders of Russia. Uh, and if you take it very seriously, you know, no, NATO has never threatened Russia. The, every border of Russia with NATO has always been the most stable border that Russia has ever had. So from that perspective, and, and I know it's probably not popular in Moscow what I'm <laughs> suggesting, but the, the, uh, the borders with NATO are rather more stable than the borders with a Ukraine that would be, you know, overarming itself for the resumption of the fight uh, uh, over there. And in the same vein, in 1955, when Germany joined, there were very specific caveats by the Allies to say you will not uh, um, reunify by force, you will not do this, and you will not do that, which, by the way, are interesting uh, in, this, in this particular context including from a Russian perspective. So I'm offering this counterintuitive argument to, to also say that you can make an argument that it is de-escalatory to expand NATO. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Great. Great panel. Always a pleasure. Always. What a great panel. And a panel where nobody was properly introduced. My apologies, Justine. Everybody knows who everybody is. <laughs> but this yeah. was brilliant. Very <laughs> great conversation. The first day of Leon Colm 2024 is up. Uh, I hope to see many of you tomorrow. We start 9.30 with uh, Admiral Rob Bauer, the chief of NATO's military committee. Uh, who will talk about uh, a new era of collective defense. And then we will also dig into the new security dynamics in uh, NATO's northern flank with uh, Finnish and soon to be Swedish NATO membership. And those of you who speak Norwegian can even enjoy a political debate where we will ask all the parties in our parliament if they are going to use 2% of GDP on defense before 2026. Or this debate will be led by Fritjof Jakobsen <laughs> from Dagens Nijnsliver. Thank you for today. It's been a great day. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks, wonderful.